Okay, thank you. So I'm guessing that uh, Friday morning lectures at 8, 8.30 are not your favorite. Uh, and I know when I was running the school that by now you're probably all completely exhausted. So I think I'm meant to promise you that I have a lecture which is, has no equations and uh, has nothing but pictures and is basically content free. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, if you look at the notes, I, you'll see that the first one of those is definitely a lie. And I hope the other two are, are, are not completely uh, true either. Um, so, but the equations are pretty tame, and they're already there for reference purposes, so, uh, so I don't think you'll have any problem with them. And I do have a couple of movies which are sort of reasonably colorful, so I hope uh, you'll be able to stay awake. Particularly because I think the subject, although this is the last, uh, uh, actually it's the last scientific talk, isn't it? Because you're giving a talk on, on um, the logistics of being a, a scientist. Uh, is nevertheless not the least. <laughs> um, in fact, it's a really exciting time to be involved in single crystal diffuse scattering because it's a technique that's been around for a very long time. Uh, I've got, I think I've got a slide which shows some data from 1941 and I think it predates even that. But, uh, uh, but it's only now, I think, getting to a stage where the technology, both instrumental technology, detector technology, um, uh, and the computational technology have caught up with it because it's quite challenging, really, to do a good job. You need to measure over very large volumes of reciprocal space, and uh, you need to do some quite he heavy-duty transforms. <laughs> and those, I was actually talking to Art Schultz uh, uh, over breakfast, and he was saying 20 years ago they proposed doing some of the stuff I was talking about, and uh, they decided it was just impossible. And now it's not really that challenging. So, um, but the other reason I'm hoping that this will not be too, too uh, difficult for you is that we've actually, just in the last year, uh, started looking at our data in a completely new way. Um, uh, it's not, uh, it's new to us, I mean, it's been developed over the last 10 years by groups in Switzerland, but which we believe will turn data which, which is actually difficult to interpret normally, uh, and, unless you're a real expert, into data where anybody can actually infer a lot of what's going on. It's to do with the 3D PDF, which I'll come to later in the talk, and, and we're really excited about that. This is the first time I've talked about it at this school, and I think it will actually, uh, 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 I think it has a chance of turning diffuse scattering from being a kind of a, a, a specialist technique into a mainstream technique in material science, at least in hard material science. So here's my uh, outline of my talk. And oh, here's my latest one, yeah. So, uh, so, so yeah, I'll give some brief introductions, what diffuse scattering looks like. Um, I get to get, just give a, a, a few um, snapshots of what sort of things have been looked at by diffuse scattering in the past. Um, uh, th this is where there are one or two equations, uh, which actually we don't use all that much, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's, it's useful to know the history. Um, and then I'm going to give two case studies, uh, one which we, I've spoken to uh, about for a while, which is one of the classic materials studied by diffuse scattering. It's a ceramic aluminosilicate mullite. And the other is this new technique, which I, I believe is going to transform the way we look at diffuse scattering in the future. Um, but then I want to come back to one of the reasons why uh, this is particularly important to give this lecture here at the SNS, and that is some of the best new instrumentation is, is now neutron instrumentation, in particular the instrument Corelli. Uh, was that included in the experimental program at all? Or? No. So, so uh, I don't know if you uh, saw Corelli. You certainly walked past it, even if you didn't. I'll show you where it is. Uh, but it's an exciting new technique which, gives, uh, which allows you to go one step further in diffuse scattering, and that's distinguishing uh, dynamic processes in diffuse scattering from static processes. Okay, and then uh, you'll find out what the last slide means later on. So, we'll okay, so diffuse scattering. Uh, now, I'm using this perceptually linear color thing, which that makes it apparently invisible, but, um, but anyway, if you look at it from sort of 30,000 feet, can you see there are a whole sort of dots here? <laughs> okay, this is an HK plane, L equals zero, so this is three-dimensional, this is a slice through three-dimensional reciprocal space. This is H, this is K, and all these dots are an integer H and K positions, they represent the Bragg peaks. And so presumably by now you're familiar with what Bragg's peaks were. I was given strict instructions not to show Bragg's law during my talk, um, <laughs> which I think I've obeyed. Um, so actually, I think I slightly didn't, but I'll see, we'll see that later. So, so and this is, what, this is the powerful technique that tells you what is the average structure in the material. Okay, what is the, what is the composition of a unit cell, that uh, the average unit cell, which is translationally invariant throughout the crystalline volume. So it's a very powerful technique. You understand the intensities of that, and you understand the average structure. However, if you keep on going down into the weeds, 
several orders of magnitude, of course, there's a lot of intensity between the Bragg peaks. Okay? We don't just want to look at the delta functions at integer HKR. We also want to look, can you see that spot? Or do you want me to use this? That's probably a bit better. So anyway, that's, uh, th there's an awful lot of intensity that's highly structured and actually quite beautiful between the Bragg peaks. And this is diffuse scattering. And it represents anything that is, represents deviations from the average structure. So uh, particularly with x-rays, that, that, that could be dynamic deviations, such as thermal vibrations, phonons. They will give rise to thermal diffuse scattering. Uh, okay, because, and I think I should have put this equation in my talk, and I don't, but we're measuring S of Q. And uh, was it Roger who gave the preliminary lecture? So anyway, S of Q, if you integrate over all frequencies, gives you uh, 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 a t equals zero snapshot of the structure. So if the atoms are all vibrating, you sort of freeze them at some p position and you get the average of all those snapshots. Um, uh, so with x-rays, uh, you see dynamic processes, but you also see static. With neutrons, in principle, you have the possibility of actually separating out the elastic scattering. That is the S of Q and omega, where omega equals zero. And that is the T equals infinity correlation function. That is the static disorder in the material, again, averaged over the, over the crystal. So, okay, so that's what diffuse scattering is. I'm gonna get used to using two-handed technique. And what does it uh, look like? So this is actually molite. Um, and again, this is this HK plane. And I think this is my movie. Uh, yeah, so if you scan L, I don't know if you can see L down here, 0.25, 0.27, et cetera, then you can see you get a beautiful array of structures throughout the Brewin zone. And eventually you're going to get to L equals one and you'll see uh, the Bragg peaks again in the, in the HKL plane. Uh, there we are. And then you see, roughly speaking, repeated, actually it really freezes out of the movie. But you see anyway that the diffuse scattering contains an enormous amount of structure. Uh, uh, and if you can model that, then you have learned essentially uh, as, uh, as Brian said, it's, this is the most powerful technique for studying short-range order in materials. And of course, real materials are, um, on the whole, messy. You know, people try and grow perfect single crystals. But often they're not, they're not perfect, and often actually the most technologically important materials are ones which are disordered. Uh, they might be disordered in order to improve their mechanical properties, uh, or they might be uh, disordered in order to electronically dope the material. For instance, that's how high temperature superconductors are created. Uh, and, uh, or they might produce you know, exotic uh, uh, nonlinear piezoelectric properties, as in relaxers, ferroelectrics, which I'll show very briefly. Basically, well, in fact, I think I'm pre prefiguring, well, okay, I, I'm, I'm prefiguring other slides, so I'll get back to that in a second. Now, why diffuse scattering then? Because, in principle, uh, if you, if you took two d models of disorder, supposing this is just a, a case where we have substitutional disorder. On the left, we have uh, a, a, an array of atoms with an array of two, two different species of atoms, which are randomly uh, cited on the, this, this square grid. On the right, you can see that the yellow atoms have a tendency to cluster together, okay? Now, the thing about that is that they actually give rise to exactly the same Bragg peaks. Okay, because the average dis compositional disorder is the same. When you do diffraction, it will say, okay, the average occupation of these is you know, whatever percentage it is, uh, and that's all you can learn from it. Um, nearly all, anyway. But with diffuse scattering, so there are the Bragg peaks which look all the same, but with diffuse scattering, you see they're quite different. So if you have completely random occupation, then throughout reciprocal space, you just see what's called Larry monotonic scattering, uh, uh, um, which is very broad and, and, and actually centered at Q equals zero. But if you have cluster disorder, as in here, in this model, then you see, for instance, quite uh, distinctive structures, such as these rods connecting the, the, uh, the Bragg peaks. And so clearly, you can tell then the difference in diffuse scattering between these two models. And this is the 1941 data in Benzil. You can look at, uh, 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 so it was measured all that time ago. Um, my own first association with diffuse scattering goes back, um, what is it now, 34 years or something? I bet you can't believe that, looking at my hair. But um, so, which was actually uh, on a triple axis at, at Harwell, which is the home of neutron scattering for many years at, in the UK. There were two reactors which closed down shortly after this. And we had a triple axis spectrometer. Did you use triple axes at all? In the, yeah. So, okay, so you know a triple axis. So what we did was actually we scanned step by step at uh, omega equals zero and rastered through this and got this diffuse scattering from yttrium stabilized zirconia. It's the same material used to make artificial diamonds. And, uh, and there's a lot of vacancy disorder in this material because of the uh, different valence of the cations. Uh, 
uh, which gives rise to this beautiful structure. That took two weeks. Okay, we, we measured it over a Christmas break, came back and plotted it up. This is SXD, which is at ISIS. It's very similar to, say, Topaz here. Um, and uh, they did the same, looked at the same material about, uh, I don't know, 2003, I think it was. And you can see here, this is the, the Q range we covered with the triple axis. So they covered a much bigger Q range, and it was all three-dimensional, and they did it in just a few hours. So, but in fact, uh, uh, and it's important that you get all three dimensions, because you know, if you have a spot, if you have a rod, rather, in two dimensions, you don't know whether it's really a rod or whether it's a plane in the third dimension. And so, uh, so really, you really want to have three-dimensional data. OK, that's the history of diffuse scattering. Right. Um, what is it good for? So I'm just going to give a very few uh, sets of examples. We actually had a workshop. This was in the planning stages for the Corelli uh, instrument, which these things take a long time to build. So back in 2003, we had a workshop. And, uh, and we sort of had a brainstorming session. And these are all the sorts of materials that could benefit from single crystal diffuse scattering. And they cover basically all of material science, um, including soft matter. Um, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, in principle, you can look at magnetic defects. You can look at quantum critical fluctuations, geometrically frustrated systems. You can look at fast ion conductors, uh, uh, intercalation compounds, uh, host gas systems. So the whole, whole range, whatever your particular fantasy is scientifically, you can realize it in diffuse scattering. Um, now, so here's just a very quick uh, run through. Some of them, this is diffuse scattering, for instance. So with the classic, the very first diffuse scattering modeling was actually done on metallic alloys. And uh, this, this is a, a cunning one where, it, because nickel has uh, 62, has a negative scattering length, you can actually make a null uh, alloy. What that means is that the Bragg peaks themselves have zero intensity, which must have made it fun to, uh, to align. But, um, uh, but it meant then that all the scattering here is diffuse scattering. And what it's telling you is exactly what I showed in that example uh, earlier on is what is the tendency for the nickel and the platinum ions to either cluster or anti-cluster. Uh, in this case, I think tend to cluster. And that's important if you want to understand the metallurgical properties of this material. Um, one that I was involved in actually in the early 80s was uh, diffuse scattering from fast ion conductors. So for example, in fluorides, um, like calcium fluoride, strontium chloride, and even uh, the reason why Harwell was interested in uranium dioxide is, uh, is another example. They actually go through what's called a superionic transition where the mobility of the anions suddenly goes from, from very low to being almost the same as in the melt. Okay. So it becomes a fast ion conductor above a certain temperature, and you get a big peak in the specific heat. And uh, this was actually called sublattice melting at the time, um, although it's not really melting. The, 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 the uh, space group doesn't change. So they're still in an ordered grid. But there clearly is a lot of disorder and a lot of mobility of these ions. And diffuse scattering turned out to be a very powerful way, here again measured on triple axis, of modeling that disorder. So here we see a peak beyond the 200, which only builds up in intensity. This is as a function of temperature. So this is low temperature going up to very high temperature. And as we go through this superionic transition, you get a big buildup of intensity uh, in this diffuse scattering. And we were able to model that in terms of, uh, here's a model, uh, in terms of a very simple structure, which uh, consists of uh, so here, here the anions sit on this simple cubic lattice, the black dots. Um, uh, uh, so the idea is that if you have mobile anions, and some of them are going to move into what this empty cube center. Here's the striped one here. This is the uh, Frenkel defect uh, that's created when these anions become mobile. And it moves into this empty cube center, and the neighboring anions here and here relax. Okay? And just that very simple model was a, a, allowed them to, to, to reproduce most of the diffuse scattering. And that's very important information if you want to then go into molecular dynamics calculations or something of you know, what is causing the ionic mobility or how do these things diffuse. Um, I've shown molecular solids uh, in the past. Benzyl actually uh, is, 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 has been measured for a while. And one of the reasons is because there's a lot of molecular flexibility. Now, I'm not a, uh, a chemist, and so I, I I'll get all the terms wrong, whether li librational or vibrational or whatever. But, um, but nevertheless, uh, you can correct me over the break. Uh, you have a lot of molecular flexibility. And the way that the, the, these things are, uh, are correlated from site to site gives rise to this very beautiful diffuse scattering here. But it, uh, OK, and I'll come back to that later, because actually it's very important in the story of Corelli. And I'll show that essentially the same data are towards the end of my talk. Relaxer ferroelectrics, these are things where you have uh, a variety of uh, cations, such as zinc and niobium, uh, 
on the B site of a perovskite, ABO3 structure. And because of the um, uh, change in the charge states, the difference in charge states of these ions, ferroelectric order, you know, which is represent the coherent displacement of one of those sublattices over the entire crystal, is, is frustrated. Uh, instead, you have a very big uh, peak in the dielectric response at uh, some temperature, which actually is temperature dependent. So if you know anything about spin glasses, that's a key sign that you've got some kind of glassy freezing. And so diffuse scattering has been used a lot to measure this material and try, and try to understand whether, for instance, it, it's, in, it's appropriate to think of this in terms of these nano domains where you have basically ferroelectric order, but only over a very small region in space that are somehow frustrated in, in this lattice, or whether actually what people now believe is it's more likely to be a kind of a random field system, if you ever know anything about that kind of physics or physics. But again, you get beautiful diffuse scattering uh, from this, which has been analyzed in terms of all these models. Um, actually, this is not in your notes, I think. Uh, so I apologize for that, because I realized this was a use case I used before. I can probably upload a revised version, which includes this slide. Um, but I used to actually talk about this in more detail, and now I'm not going to, because I'm talking about 3D PDF instead. But uh, one of the reasons we got involved in diffuse scattering in the last 20 years is because of uh, our interest in polaronic disorder in manganites. So uh, in, in these cases, you have, for instance, these uh, MnO6 octahedra. Some of them are four plus, which means that uh, the, the electronic state is spherical. But some of them are three plus, in which case you have what's called a yarn teller active orbital, where, um, uh, say, an EG orbital is occupied. And that has a tendency to push out the oxygens on either side. Uh, and uh, in these materials, at the higher temperature in the paramagnetic phase, uh, this kind of uh, what we'd call a small polon actually gets frozen. In other words, the, the, the electrons get trapped on these sites. And so you get a lot of, of disorder on the, on the lattice caused by the fact that you get some of these yarn teller distorted ions and some are not. Okay. Uh, at low temperature, they all become homogeneous again. And so you can tell something about that just from this, what we call Huang scattering, which is uh, scattering around the Bragg peaks, which can be modeled in terms of the strain field that arises out of the, uh, uh, around one of these uh, polarons. Um, and there's a beautiful analytic theory for that, um, uh, which actually I probably haven't referenced in here, which I apologize, but never mind. But you can also see these, th these incommensurate peaks here. So this is now at a point three along the H direction and one along the L. And what that tells you, if you ever see an incommensurate peak like that, that's telling you that there's some modulation in the, cr in the system. It's slightly incommensurate, which means that the modulation is not, uh, uh, does not sort of peak at, in at at discrete positions, but actually sort of has what looks like a charge density wave modulation. And so here you see this yarn teller modulation is long, then short, short, and it's long again, short, short. So it's actually a longitudinal yarn teller modulation, which, uh, which diffuse scattering by analyzing the intensities of all of these peaks. Uh, our postdoc, Branton Campbell, was able to produce a beautiful model of, of just what uh, the polaronic correlations are. They have a tendency to form these kind of stripes uh, in the orthogonal plane. Okay, so CMR, colossal magnetoresistance, is, is, is one of the consequences of this polaronic disorder. And it was a hot topic at least 10 years ago, and it's uh, still studied now. And then, and then there's also magnetic diffuse scattering. Uh, so there's a huge amount of interest in things like quantum spin liquids. Um, and uh, this was actually before the current interest in quantum spin liquids. It's work by Sung-Hun Lee on zinc chromate. And uh, one of the things about these materials is they're frustrated because the spins can't if they have, say, antiferromagnetic interactions, you can't simultaneously satisfy them all on the vertices of a tetrahedron. Um, but what's interesting is that they, they actually get, in this case, what are called spin protectorates. So you can see these, this spin here, and this spin, this red one, this one, et cetera, here. I don't know if you can tell from this diagram, but you can actually rotate all of these spins without affecting any of the interactions of the other spins around. So in other words, they, they're free to rotate together in what uh, Sung Hun Lee called a spin protectorate. And, and that gives rise to this beautiful diffuse scattering, uh, uh, which is characteristic of, of, of that collective motion of, of just a small cluster of ions. OK, so I think this is where I've got a couple of equations, yeah. So I mean, the, this, is the, uh, uh, um, this is the fundamental equation that uh, presumably Roger uh, led you through, uh, which governs the intensity of all our of scattering. You know, we have a whole set of, uh, of, of different atoms on sites uh, 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 I and J. 
which are separated by Rij. And if you can do, perform this summation, you, you basically can calculate what is the scattering intensity that you'll see in this material. Now, if you have that first example I showed, which, by the way, I should have acknowledged Thomas Profin, who, uh, you, did you hear a lecture from Thomas Profin earlier? Did he talk about PDF? Oh, Kate Page talked about PDF. Okay, so he used to give a PDF tech talk. But anyway, he, he, he produced the models, which I showed earlier. If you have the, the completely random distribution, then you have, uh, then the only diffuse scattering you have, here you have, th this equation will, can be factored into two, you end up with uh, the Bragg peaks. This is just the equation for all the Bragg peaks in here. But you end also get a term which is exactly the same as you s get for nuclear incoherent scattering. Okay, so in fact, you can think of if you have a random occupation of sites uh, by two different atomic species with their own scattering length, that's formally exactly equivalent to having uh, the same element but with different isotopes and different scattering lengths. And so, so just as with incoherent scattering, it's Q-independent. So here, is, again, with this Lowry monotonic diffuse scattering, it's, it's Q-independent. So you get a constant background, just f which is, uh, whose intensity is given by the concentration of the atoms A and B and their respective scattering lengths. But the very first model of diffuse scattering actually was uh, 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 from, from Cowley. Uh, he was interested in, uh, for instance, copper three gold. And at high temperature, copper three gold has... Uh, this face-centered cubic thing where the copper and the gold atoms are all randomly occupied, okay? So you just have copper and gold on all of these sites. But as you go down in temperature, eventually it, uh, it goes through an order disorder transition, goes into this copper three gold structure where uh, the, the uh, coppers for, go onto the, onto the faces of the face-centered cube structure. But above that then, you get uh, this short range order which Cowley was able to sort of uh, 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 display in this form. Now, instead of having something completely random, we have these Cowley short-range order parameters, now often called Warren-Cowley short-range order parameters, which uh, represent deviations from the average. So what these parameters show is that if you have an atom A, um, then, uh, um, then if, you, if, you can't, if you go to the vector Rij, um, the alpha i will have this value, where this is the probability of the other, of the, um, Sorry, if you have a site at atom B, then, the, then uh, this will be the probability that the site that's uh, Rij apart is uh, an atom A. And you can see that if, if the probability is just the average, in other words, Ca, then this will go to zero and this will drop out and you'll end up with just the uh, monotonic scattering. But if it's not zero, then this basically is a way of modeling the probabilities that, uh, that you have, tend to have a tendency to have clustering. You know, if you have a B, then is there more likely to have a B, a B next to it or, or an atom A? And from that, you're able to actually um, uh, produce a model of the diffuse scattering. And here's the tendency for these uh, extra peaks to form in diffuse scattering. Eventually, these peaks will actually become the extra peaks that appear in the FCC structure. OK, so diffuse scattering here is a precursor of an order disorder transition. But if you have then, this is assuming that all the atoms are the same site. But if they have different ionic radii, then in principle, there will also be other terms in here which correspond to the um, the size defect, the fact that the ions around a larger um, ion will tend to, to relax to compensate for that. And again, that can be expressed in a fairly simple form. And then you get into much more complex uh, types of formulation in terms of correlations between uh, atoms, such as this one, and there are others. And uh, um, you, you know, there are whole textbooks on this, which you're welcome to read. Um, this feels a little bit out of place, but anyway, th thermal diffuse scattering. I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, it, particularly if you measure with x-rays, you're always going to have thermal diffuse scattering, which is just from the phonon. So even if you have a perfect crystal, such as silicon, and even if you're down at zero temperature, you still have zero point motion of the ions. And that gives rise to diffuse scattering, which is basically the, uh, the fact that you have all of this intensity from the phonons uh, projected down onto your um, total scattering plane. Um, uh, so you have dispersion relations. You have the uh, different, uh, uh, the intensities of the, of the diffuse scattering is then going to have a term from the, uh, 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 from the frequency and from the temperature dependence, et cetera. And even in a perfect crystal, you can actually use it to analyze the thermal spectra. And uh, now I'm actually, I, I realize I'm probably talking a bit too long, so I'm going to flash through this. But this is just some rules of thumb, which basically reflect the fact that all diffuse scattering is a Fourier transform. And so, um, um, so if you have rods of scattering, that means you have planes of, uh, of disorder. And we'll see examples of that later, so just have that as a reference. 
Okay, so I wanted to give one quick case study, which is mullite. Mullite is an alumina silicate, uh, which can, has all of these tetrahedra coupled with these octahedra. These tetrahedra are ALO4 or SiO4 tetrahedra. But if you, um, if, if you um, put in excess aluminum, then you're going to generate vacancies on these uh, bridging uh, oxygen sites here. And what happens when you do that is that the neighboring cations relax away from the vacancy to produce these and produce another tetrahedron here. So you get these sort of tri-clusters here around each vacancy. And that's a motif then that appears, uh, that, that was identified from uh, powder diffraction, which sort of showed on average that these extra sites existed. How would we measure this? Okay, so with x-rays, measuring diffuse scattering is actually now not that difficult. Um, uh, we, we, th this is, we've just been using a classic technique that protein crystallographers use. You just put the sample in the beam here. This is the beam coming in. This is the beam stop. Um, and we rotate the sample actually continuously around this phi axis here. Uh, sometimes we have a cryocooler to cool it down. But we have a de detector here. In particular, this is a fast area detector, a Pilatus 2M, which is collecting frames while the sample rotates continuously. So we can collect frames at 10 frames a second on this Pilatus 2M. You can go even faster, but we don't. So you can do a full rotation in 0.1 degree steps in about six minutes, okay? That's 3,600 frames, each one of them about eight megabyte TIFF files, 30 gigabytes in six minutes. Uh, there are gaps between the chips, so you have to do three different positions. But uh, these detectors have a very low background, very high dynamic range, and, and uh, we're particularly interested in doing these at very high energy with the new generation of cadmium telluride detectors. So this is actually one of the first measurements we did, and uh, this is a, a, a readout on a, a terminal window of the angles as they're varying while we're collecting frames. And each of these lines represents another eight megabyte image <laughs> being collected, okay? So I must admit, when I first saw this, my, I, uh, I started panicking. But um, <laughs> because it doesn't take any time at all to collect, you know, what are fairly large volumes of data. Okay. So, um, but nevertheless, we have a, years developed our own workflow, which mirrors what, what uh, many other groups do as well, uh, is that so we, uh, we, we first have to uh, determine all the peak positions, of the Bragg peak positions, rather, which allow us to orient the crystal. So here are all the Bragg peaks, and this is two theta, and this is azimuthal angle. You can see they all line up on these two theta lines. That allows us to determine an orientation matrix, from the, uh, which is, you know, what is the orientation of the crystal in the beam? Um, here again are all the Bragg peaks. And that allows us then to do a coordinate transformation into H and K, which produced that movie I showed earlier, and then you can take arbitrary cuts through that data. And we can now do that in at least 20 minutes, but sometimes even over five if we get uh, a smart computer scientist to help us parallelize it all. And so Marlite was, was, uh, has produced this beautiful diffuse scratching you saw in the movie, um, which is very strongly dependent on QL. Um, it has actually these incommensurate peaks here, and if you remember what I said in manganite, incommensurate means there's some kind of modulation. But in this case, it's a vacancy modulation, not a polar on modulation. Um, and that's what that's showing here. And the way that we used to do this, or at least the way that very smart people like Richard Welby used to do this, is they'd use a mix of chemical intuition uh, with sort of Monte Carlo uh, uh, optimization of the data. So, for instance, you know, they could work out that you're not going to get two vacancies together because there's nowhere for this central cation to move. Um, and there are other things here where you can't, they're not even going to be here because this oxygen becomes way over bonded. All the cation around this vacancy moves here, this one that moves there, and you end up with uh, four cations around this one oxygen. So he, he basically came up with a sort of an energy landscape and produced a whole set of parameters which he was then able to optimize against the data to produce these Warren Cowley parameters, saying what is the probability that if you have a vacancy here that there'll be another vacancy at other equivalent sites. And he, as you can see, he did a beautiful job. But this takes quite a lot of time, okay, and, you, and also brilliance. Um, um, ironically, one of the, a, a quicker way of doing it nowadays, probably, is to use ab initio methods, which is to actually use density functional theory to calculate what should the vacancy distribution be. So in this case, we actually have a whole series of uh, supercells. These are just a small subset of, of, the, of unit cells in the crystal. Um, and we put in vacancies in, in random configurations within these supercells. And then somebody like Peter Zappel at Argonne did a total energy calculation for each of the supercells. What is the energy of, of the whole supercell 
in absolute terms given uh, that this vacancy configuration. And from that, he was then able to sort of produce a kind of pseudo ising like Hamiltonian, which is a cluster expansion basically, which says, okay, um, uh, if we have two vacancies together, then that's gonna be characterized by an, uh, this Jij. If we have, for instance, a tri-cluster, then there'll be this Jijk. So you can generate this cluster expansion, which basically means you've, you've, you've collapsed that whole ab initio calculation onto a small set of numbers, which do reproduce the energies of larger clusters, and that allows you then to do a sort of Monte Carlo calculation of a very large cluster, like 25,000 um, atoms, uh, showing what the distribution of, of the uh, atoms would be in that. And from that, you can then determine things like the pair distribution function. What is the probability that if you have an, a vacancy at one point, that you have another vacancy at another point? Uh, in, this is now in real space, A and B, and from that, you can then calculate the diffuse scattering. Uh, um, and in principle, if you have to optimize these JIJ, you can close the loop, okay? So as I say, because of computational power, this actually might be a quicker way of doing it now than having uh, to, 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 to think about a problem for, for many months and sort of uh, optimize a whole set of energy parameters manually. Um, but it turns out that we think that some of the, the uh, 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 that um, it nevertheless missed some of the longer range correlations that are, for instance, represented by this, uh, th these incommensurate wave vectors. Um, so the fact that we have that modulation means that, as I say, there's some sort of modulation of the vacancy concentration, which has a, a, a periodicity of about three lattice units. This would be one, uh, uh, this would be the simplest version of that. You have a stripe here, you have a stripe here, three lattice units away. And then the next one up, up uh, in the uh, C equals one plane, one plane up, that same stripe will be out of phase. And you can imagine that this might be caused by, for instance, just Coulomb interactions between the vacancies. Um, and it turns out that that is exactly what, uh, what the ab initio calculations uh, predicted, that you'd have a tendency for the vacancies to line up in these stripes. Okay. Actually, I'm not as, I thought I was really bad for time, so I rushed through that a bit. Um, but I'm not so badly off for time, but anyway. Um, so, so, for instance, in Welbury's model, I, uh, they, he didn't predict these stripes, but they're actually there present in the, in, in the data and um, uh, uh, as the ab initio. So, I think, w w so basically the point is that the way that, that uh, diffuse scattering was analyzed in the past, the, the, the total volume of data, of, sorry, the total volume of diffuse scattering was well modeled by these short range order parameters but uh, there might have been details associated with the longer range correlations that were missed in which the ab initio calculations got right. Okay, so d that might put you off diffuse scattering because it's very complicated and uh, it can be quite dif difficult to analyze. So now I want to encourage you to think that actually it's not nearly as, uh, as difficult as all that. And that is by looking at, the t at a new way of looking at the data, which uh, the Swiss group led by Thomas Weber at ETH Zurich uh, has called 3D Delta PDF. Okay, so you've had electron PDF, is that right, uh, techniques? So, and as you know, it's a very powerful and it's also an extremely popular way of, of, of measuring um, disorder, um, uh, where basically you, you um, uh, instead of doing a reed felt refinement to, uh, to some powder diffraction data or even uh, uh, amorphous data, you never let you, do a, a, a Fourier transform of the total data set. And from that, you determine uh, the probability of all of the interatomic vectors in the, in the material, okay, as a function of, uh, of increasing R, uh, those vectors that represent uh, vectors in the average structure and those vectors that represent deviations from the average structure. Okay, that's, that's what you like, is it? Okay, uh, so it's a very powerful technique. Although you can see that, um, uh, it would be particularly sensitive to, to, for instance, deviations at very low distance. It becomes rather difficult to use it to see deviations from the average structure at very large distance because there are so many uh, uh, atoms uh, that are in the average structure that seeing deviations from that can be quite difficult. So it's a technique that tends to be better at small r. I don't know if there are any PDF specialists that would disagree with me. But anyway, that's, that's our claim. So, so this is the uh, standard PDF and, and at uh, here, of course, you can do PDF on instruments like Nomad. Uh, at the APS, I don't know if any of you saw this beamline, Peter Chupas and Karina Chapman are, run a beamline which is 11 IDB. 
uh, where they ha have an, uh, an area detector, and which means that they me measure the Prouder profile in, in single measurements, and it's very fast, and it's heavily oversubscribed. And one of the powers of the technique is it allows you to look at in situ uh, studies. You can scan across, for instance, an actual electrochemical cell and see the variations in the disorder as you go across the cell. So we can't mimic that with 3D PDF, for reasons I'll come to, but, but uh, uh, 3D PDF is a way of just generalizing what you can learn with one-dimensional PDF and looking at it in 3D, okay? So this is the IMAX version of PDF. This is sort of you know, what James Cameron would tend to produce rather than uh, uh, just the conventional movie. Um, because if you have data in S of Q in three dimensions in a single crystal, um, then there's nothing to stop you doing a three-dimensional Fourier transform. And then you have all the distribution of the atomic vectors, but in three dimensions, okay? Which means, for instance, that if, if, if the deviation from the average structure involves a transverse displacement, have an atom here, and instead of being there in the average structure, it's there, that you probably couldn't see very easily with regular PDF because it would be appearing at the same uh, R distance as the uh, average structure. Uh, what you can tend to be able to see are, are longitudinal displacements. And there are, I'm not a PDF expert, so I don't want to, to um, um, uh, uh, you know, there may, there may be all sorts of tips and tricks that the experts know how to do. Nevertheless, you can see that in 3D PDF, in principle, you have a lot more information, okay? But there's one thing that you can do with 3D PDF, which, which you certainly can't do with regular PDF, at least as it now exists. Um, and this is something that Thomas Weber and Arkady Simonov and, uh, have, uh, have uh, been developing, and we've only been using in the last year. And it's called punch and fill. And the idea behind this is that uh, if you do a Fourier transform of the scattering intensity, okay, uh, so you're transforming stuff that's in HKL into real space again, and you're transforming it back, um, you get what's uh, called a Patterson function. Uh, so we haven't solved the phase space problem when you do this transformation. You'd, all you know are all of the possible interatomic vectors from any particular site. So if, if a site has atom A, then you'll find all, all, all of the types of interatomic vectors that connect A to the other atoms in the crystal. And also if there's atom B, then you'll also be summing that with all the sites of, uh, that are uh, uh, surround atom B. So it could be a very complex function. Um, but you don't know, for instance, if, the, if there is an atom at this position, how it correlates with the one that may be uh, at a slightly different position. Um, you just have the distribution of those vectors. However, it turns out that because of the properties of Fourier transform, that you can actually separate this into the Fourier transform of the average structure and the Fourier transform of deviations from the average structure. Now, we know what the average structure is. In Q space, the average structure is encoded in the Bragg peaks at these integer HKL positions here. Okay, uh, so this here represents the Patterson function which comes from the average structure. And this then represents all the deviations from the average structure. So is there a way of perhaps just concentrating on this because this is what we're really interested in. We can solve crystallographically what this is by just looking at the Bragg peaks and forgetting about the diffuse scattering. But the reason for measuring the diffuse scattering is because we want to determine this. Can we determine this by getting rid of the Bragg peaks? Well, of course, there's a very simple way of doing that and that's to get rid of them, okay? It's, so it's what the punch method means. So we take the three-dimensional data set and we fill uh, in little spheres around every Bragg peak. We just put in not a numbers or something or whatever the, um, um, uh, we, we did this with just some simple Python scripts. But anyway, that's the punch method. Now, of course, you don't just want to, uh, to, to Fourier transform that. If you can, in principle, you could. You'd like to fill the gaps. And so we actually used uh, ourselves some astrophysics algorithms which are used to, you know, find missing galaxies in their, in their data or something. They have a way of interpolating across the, um, the intensities of their sky maps, um, which, you know, might be a bit suspect in some considerations. But it, anyway, it works really well here. So now we have a three-dimensional volume, S of Q, which only contains the diffuse scattering from, which represent deviations from the average structure. Okay. Um, now, this is a full three-dimensional. Sometimes we don't have all the data we might. We might need to do some symmetrization to fill in some gaps. Um, but on the whole, with our three-dimensional technique, with x-rays anyway, and as I'll show later with neutrons, we can actually fill in those gaps very well. Okay. So uh, 
uh, and I think this just shows you the, uh, the, the, the this we punched out the peaks and we we filled it in with the red spots. Okay, so I want to give an example of that technique, which just shows how powerful um, the the idea that Thomas Rabin came up with in ways that we hadn't appreciated until we did it ourselves. That's often true in science. It's best to actually just do something and then see if it works. And uh, because looking at their papers, we hadn't quite understood just what we could learn. So we looked at a material which is uh, of some interest to uh, people involved in battery technology. Actually, this particular material isn't so interesting, but, uh, but uh, for instance, various different, B205 has certainly been considered for various, uh, uh, as potential cathodes or particularly multivalent uh, cathode materials. But anyway, this is sodium intercalated V205. And it turns out that actually, if you put in enough sodium, then the V205 layers sort of produce this rather buckled structure of uh, pyramids and octahedra. But the sodium ions form these simple ladders. Okay? And if you do powder diffraction on this, you can determine the average structure. And from the average structure, you can tell that the average occupation of each of these sites is about 50%. But that's all you can tell. Okay. So that sodium sub ladder is like, but you don't know how. So we did the diffuse scattering measurements, and this is um, what we saw were these rods of scattering. This is k equals a half plane, so there are no Bragg peaks. This is h, l, and k equals a half. So all the Bragg peaks are in the k equals integer planes. We just have these diffuse rods, and th that represents disorder coming out of the sodium sublattice. Now it turns out, this is the room temperature. When we cool down to 100 Kelvin, then a lot of the, uh, the rods actually started developing Bragg peaks. In other words, we've gone through a transition where we develop long-range order in the sodium sublattice, okay? Um, um, because, um, so here the sodium sublattice is completely disordered, or at least, you know, only short-range correlated. Here there is actually a degree of, of long-range order within that sodium sublattice, as shown by the existence of Bragg peaks along this uh, crystal. So how do you model this? Well, in Q-space, it's really complicated, okay? So the green represents the high temperature structure. You can see these rods are really very, uh, have a strong Q dependence. Um, it's very complex. Uh, we know because they're rods that they represent roughly two dimensional disorder. In other words, it's correlations of the sodium ions within the ladder plane, okay? But that's, uh, and we can infer some other things, but anyway, this is quite complicated. And then at low temperature, superimposed on that, some of this intensity goes into these Bragg peaks. Okay, so how do we model this? Well, it turns out we don't have to. So if we actually just simply do the Fourier transform of the three-dimensional data in, from Q space back into real space, we now have sets of intraatomic vectors which only represent deviations from the average structure. So what this is, is a symmetric log plot in real space. By symmetric, it means that, uh, that we have positive and negative values. If it's red, it means it's greater than, than zero. If it's blue, it means it's less than zero. And these all represent vectors in the, in the in particularly in the sodium sublattice, which deviate in probability from the average structure, which you know is completely disordered. The average structure is just a, a random occupation of sodium. Okay. Now we have these weird three rung, rung ladders. Okay. So what does that mean? So we have two rung uh, ladders of sodium in real space. When we look in PDF, we seem to have three rung ladders. And the reason is quite simple. It's because we don't know what is the phase of that intratomic vector. So we have to consider that there are intratomic vectors which will arise from a sodium ion that happens to be on the left rung that couple them to the right rung. So here we have a sodium ion, uh, for instance, and we're saying, okay, there's a probability that uh, there, there will be another sodium ion at this vector away on, on the right-hand rung. And in this case, this probability is red. It's, it's, it's greater than average probability. Whereas this probability is, uh, is blue, means that it's very unlikely that you have a sodium there. But of course, the sodium ion could be on the right-hand rung, and so there could be a probability of it off to the left. So we have these vectors as well, and it just represents basically the same thing, that we have uh, uh, this uh, diagonal probability. And then, of course, there are probabilities along the, the ladders. So these two-rung ladders give rise to three-rung ladders in PDF space. Okay. Now, what that, we also, of course, have correlations between ladders. And you can see here, then, this is exactly one lattice unit. So what that's saying is that if this right-hand rung is occupied by a sodium ion, then this right-hand rung will be occupied, okay? But the other two are blue, so it means this one will not be, okay? And similarly, 
if this is occupied, this will be occupied, but not that one because uh, these things are blue. So we've already seen then that, that not only are these correlations within the ladders, but they're, they're correlations between the ladders. And actually, without doing any modeling, you can basically say that is what the structure of the, of the sodium ions is. There's a zigzag um, configuration of sodium ions, uh, which may not seem all that surprising uh, from given Coulomb repulsion, but you can also tell that they're in phase in neighboring uh, uh, rungs. Now, um, it turns out that you can actually also learn then about the, um, uh, the length dependence of this. So here we see at high temperature that we have rather small correlations between neighboring ladders. If we go into lower temperature, we start seeing longer range correlations. If we go below the, this order disorder transition where we had the Bragg peaks, that Bragg peak intensity is also included in the PDF and it's showing us that these same short range correlations persist over much longer range. We're actually imaging effectively an order disorder transition in real space using the diffuse scattering without having done any modeling. Okay, so this is, this is why I think this is the, the way to go because diffuse scattering, you can't tell anything just by looking at it exact what's going on necessarily without doing some modeling. With this PDF, you can al automatically infer some stuff without having done any modeling. And of course, you can then turn things like the length scale of the correlations. Uh, it's good to have uh, good spatial resolution coming with high energies rather than lower energies. And this is Mullite, which shows that we actually do see those stripes in the PDF space. So this is, uh, vi these are the vacancies being ordered along here at A equals zero. And you can see there's a whole string of red dots also at 3A and the ones in between the blue, so they're less likely to be vacancies here. Okay, so I, um, let me go through this because I think I'm running out of time. So why is it particularly exciting time at the SNS? If you go back to that benzyl case, um, with the molecular solid, you remember, had this beautiful diffuse scattering. When it was measured on SXD, um, they, dis they noticed something rather interesting in the data. This is where I put in, this is sort of almost like Bragg's law, but, uh, <laughs> but what we can see is that for any particular Q, you can solve that Q, you can produce the same Q rather, either by going to low uh, angle or to going to higher wavelength. And so you can actually produce the same plane of scattering uh, using different detectors at different angles and different wavelength ranges, okay? And you, this is apparently the same Q range, and yet it looks entirely, completely different. And so they inferred from that that probably some of the scattering was inelastic. And that's almost certainly correct. But how do we tell? Well, it turns out now here at the SNS we can. And that's because there is a machine called Corelli, which tr uh, aims to, to, to combine the efficiency of a white beam instrument. So this is sort of how uh, a machine like Topaz does, uh, covers reciprocal space, has a whole range of wavelengths. And so it's measuring on a whole set of expanding aval spheres as a function of wavelength and it fills the volume of reciprocal space that way uh, very efficiently, okay? But it doesn't provide you with any energy discrimination. But if you have a fixed KI, as in a chopper machine like Arcs or Sequoia, in principle, you could al also fill space, but you'd have to then rotate the sample because you're measuring on a single Avalt sphere and you'd have to rotate the sample in order to fill the volume instead of just measuring on these sort of spherical surfaces, okay? So could we do both, get the, combine the efficiency of of uh, white beam Lowry techniques with um, um, energy discrimination. And it turns out that if you go back to the literature of the 60s and the 70s, there was an awful lot of mathematical work done about how to use different types of modulated beam techniques, either Fourier techniques or, or using pseudo-random statistical choppers to modulate a, a neutron beam. And these techniques became very popular in th those days and were used in a number of classic experiments but they've almost they've fallen into entirely into disuse now uh, for a reason I'll explain. But you see, here's an LT diagram, okay, which explains the principle of, of one of those pseudo-random techniques that, that, that is now utilized on Corelli. Okay, so you've seen diagrams like this, I'm guessing, through, um, th th through the school. Um, this is time with respect to when the po proton po pulse hits the target. Okay, so this is when the neutrons are all produced at T0 here, and this is distance away from the target. So, so we go a certain amount of distance, and here's then we put a chopper in the beam, but instead of a single disc chopper or a Fermi chopper, we put in uh, a chopper which has a whole set of apertures in it in some kind of a sequence, okay, um, uh, which is apparently random. So imagine you have a disc 
and there are sort of, in principle, 256 slots on that disk that, uh, uh, that where you could put an aperture, and you put an aperture in uh, 128 of those slots, but not in any sort of regular sequence. You put them in some kind of a random sequence or apparently random sequence. It can't be exactly random. Uh, it's called pseudo-random. But nevertheless, you put h run 128 slots, or alternatively, you know, you paint sort of absorbing paint over the other 128. Okay, so you only net let neutrons through at certain times. So what happens when you, uh, you, you uh, pr the neutrons get produced? You then get, to, as in any white beam technique, you get a whole distribution of wavelengths being produced, and some of them get through these slots, and others don't. So if you have an elastic peak, then here's, here's where the sample is, at LS, just behind the chopper then these, these neutrons will go through the sample and, uh, and come out at the same velocity. Might get scattered in, in angle, but they come out at the same velocity. And you get an elastic peak. So you get one here, you get one here, you get one here, you get another one here. Okay. But supposing you have in this sample inelastic scattering. So when it gets to the sample, then the uh, neutron might lose energy. And so, so there might be, say, an inelastic peak here, there's another inelastic peak here, another one here, another one here. And if it, you're at higher temperature, then you might get an energy gain peak as, as well. If one gains energy, so is, um, if, if, you, if you imagine that the, 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 this distribution of intensities is roughly Q-independent, you might get a whole series of these three peak structures uh, pr produced by all of these uh, beams. However, this is not very much use because everything's scrambled. We've got elastic peaks and inelastic peaks all appearing in the same time channels. How do we unscramble them? And that's where the mathematics becomes interesting because uh, uh, if you actually cross-correlate this signal with the pseudo-random sequence that you use to, to modulate the beam, miraculously you get out the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the original scattering as a function of energy transfer. Uh, cross-correlation gives you essentially the three-peak structure back again. Uh, so this machine, Corelli, is actually being built on this beam line here. And it's been running for about uh, uh, two years now. Um, Corelli, uh, the name Corelli uh, might be thought of as like an acronym. Um, this is Vivaldi, which is uh, 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 an instrument at the ILL, Institute of Long Range. It's probably the most clever acronym in the world. I think it stands for Very Intense Vertical Axis Lowry Diffractometer. OK. I sometimes wonder whether they actually designed the instrument based on the acronym. But, um, but anyway, so Corelli is not a, uh, an acronym. It's actually a pretentious metaphor. So uh, uh, we actually uh, had this idea of, of uh, well, Corelli was a near contemporary of Vivaldi, but he is it's called the father of the concerto grosso. If you know anything about Baroque music, uh, this is a sort of predates the romantic concerto where you have a sort of small group of instruments that are embedded in an orchestra. And sometimes they play along with the orchestra, sometimes they play their own music. And that's what gives the, the music its special character. And so we thought actually, that you can think of diffuse scattering as being essentially the same thing, that you have sort of disordered atoms forming some sort of small clusters, and they give rise to the interesting functionality of the material. They, they enhance the properties of the material. Sometimes they, they just go along with the overall, um, you know, phonon transport or electron transport or whatever. Anyway, so we thought that was, a, that was cool. So it's been built uh, very uh, well by Feng Yi, and now Yao Walyu is an instrument scientist, and, and here it is in, in various stages of uh, being built. And here's, so here's the beam line, here's the chopper, and here's the uh, scattering vessel. And, uh, and cross-correlation works because uh, if you take the raw data, this is the modulated beam where the chopper is sort of drifting in phase with respect to the instant beam, and you cross-correlate, you get out this, this, this is simulation. And in principle, you can get both elastic and inelastic peaks out. But in fact, um, uh, it works in real. So this is vanadium scattering, where you've got this modulated beam, and out comes the uh, scattered beam. If we go back to, uh, to uh, Benzil, okay, where they've, which they've done on. Uh, and you get, again, the same sort of diffuse scattering that you saw on SXD over 14 years ago. But here's the really interesting thing. You see that diffuse scattering here without any cross-correlation. So you're just measuring the total scattering. You pin in the cross-correlation, it's gone. So in other words, actually all of the diffuse scattering is dynamic, not just some of it. So cross-correlation works, and it helps to distinguish these things. And I haven't really got time to this is relaxer work, but, it shows, but now it's, it's a powerful enough machine that you can go through whole phase diagrams uh, very quickly, and you can generate an awful lot of data uh, that you can use in complementarity with x-rays, for instance, to learn about uh, the atomic displacements in this material. But I just want to end 
and uh, I'm rushing a little bit, but I just want to end with showing that this 3D Delta PDF technique works on Corelli as well. And I'm going to share it with, uh, with this copper selenide. Um, copper selenide is a material in which the, the, the copper site, there are multiple copper sites within the unit cell that are partially occupied, okay? And at high temperature, it goes through one of these superionic transitions where the copper ions become very, very mobile. Indeed, it was, some, it was called by one group a phonon liquid electron crystal. In, it has very good thermoelectric properties. And in thermoelectrics, you want to have good electronic conduction, hence the electron crystal, that's, that's not affected by the disorder. But you want to have very poor thermal conduction from the phonons. And in this case, they argued that perhaps the phonons, actually some of the transverse phonons didn't even exist because the copper sublattice was disordered. But if we do this 3D delta PDF technique, here are all the atoms in the unit cell. So some of the copper ions are at these quarter, quarter, quarter positions. Others are distributed on these tetrahedra, okay? Here's the symmetrized uh, data uh, with a lot of powder peaks and various things like that. And then, uh, but if you do the PDF, you end up with, uh, uh, again, sets of spots representing possible intratomic vectors. In particular, for instance, you can see that if this quarter, quarter, quarter is occupied, this three quarters, quarter, quarter is not going to be occupied because it's blue. But if you go up a little bit in, in to a 16th C, you're now probing these kind of vectors, and you can see that these are red. So for some reason or other, neighboring tetrahedral sites will be occupied if these ones are not. And you can go through the whole unit cell. So this 3D PDF technique, again, gives you model-independent insights into the nature of the disorder without having done any kind of complex uh, modeling. So um, I'm sorry, I should have left more time for questions. Are they, are they, um, so, so this is anyway the, the final stages. I think this is a very exciting time for diffuse scattering. Be uh, you know, we've just started to scratch the surface ourselves, uh, uh, and we're, we're benefiting from a lot of developments by a lot of groups that have, have, uh, have, have uh, meant that now is the time to get into this field if you uh, haven't before. There are things like detector technology, such as the existence of these high-energy, fast area detectors for x-rays. And for instance, you can do things like micro-diffuse scattering, uh, where you're scanning uh, the beam across the sample to look at longer length scales from the disorder. But we also have the computational power to do a lot more ab initio modeling, which means we're less dependent on, on, on intuition, chemical intuition. Um, and there may also be a role for things like machine learning, where we, this is a book of optical transforms which shows you know, what different types of disorder produce what types of diffraction patterns. And you know, if you get a computer to, to, to read this book and, and learn its contents, then perhaps that can actually help you in the refinement of the data. This is an example where machine learning was used to identify rods of scattering on topaz data. Um, a whole lot of uh, material that you can look at to, to find out more about diffuse scattering. Uh, uh, Discus is part of the standard software used to analyze diffuse scattering. Um, um, but these are more general books about diffuse neutron scattering and diffuse X-ray scattering. And I finish with a song. Um, I'm not going to sing. But my predecessor in this, uh, who gave these lectures for many years, is Gene Ice, uh, who's now retired, um, used to bring his guitar to, to uh, his lectures. And, uh, and he would reinforce everything that you, uh, he hoped you'd learn during the lecture by putting them into words. Um, so there they are. I'm not going to read them out. I, I gather you're going to have a party this evening. I thought one of the things you could do, if any of you are budding composers, is perhaps you could come up with a tune that would, uh, would fit the words, and you can uh, perhaps have a competition for the best tune that fits the words. But actually, in, in just a few verses, he captures nearly everything I've done, and uh, perhaps uh, that would have kept you awake more at uh, Friday at 8.30 in the morning than, uh, than all the detailed slides. But anyway, I hope to persuade you that diffuse scattering is something you ought to think about doing, particularly with uh, you know, the new developments that, that uh, allow us to, to, to look at the data in new ways. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, well, okay, so actually that was the slide I rushed over a bit, wasn't it, which, which um, 
Um, I mean, there are, so if you have, if you have one dimensional disorder, for instance, you form just purely chains and they're completely uncorrelated with each other, then that will give rise to, to planes of scattering. Um, here we are. So, um, okay. Uh, um, so, yeah, so if you see d planes of diffuse scattering, then that tends to mean that there will be some kind of, you know, chain-like dis disorder. If you see rods, that tends to mean then that there's some kind of two-dimensional disorder in the uh, perpendicular to those rods, um, which is uncorrelated. So if you have stacking faults in the material, say, you know, which are then uh, uncorrelated with each other, then that will produce rods, just very similar to the truncation rods that some of you may be familiar with from surface X-ray scattering, for example. Um, uh, but of course, you can also have then three-dimensional disorder. Um, if you look at this atlas of optical transforms, then in principle, all of you know you, you can you can identify different types of diffuse scattering with all sorts of different types of disorder. But sometimes there's not an easy one-to-one -one mapping, and ultimately you will have to do some modeling. I mean, you know, you can infer some things from from looking at the diffuse scattering. But that's one of the reasons I'm excited about 3D PDF is that you know you can infer an awful lot more, actually transforming it back into real space. You, for example, presumably would see those chains, just like we saw these, the, the, how these ladders form these, these um, you know, these planes of disorder. Sure. If you have incoherent scattering? I mean, it, so if, if, if you're talking about uh, say nuclear incoherent scattering, then of course that will produce a background, a, a constant background in, in reciprocal space. One of the nice things about now about the PDF technique is that um, you, it's a Fourier filtering technique. So if you have a constant intensity, for instance, as, as some kind of background signal, then when you, uh, you transform it back into real space, that will disappear into this R equals zero spot, <laughs> which... Uh, um, I mean, in principle, you can use the R equals zero spot to do some kind of calibration if you know all your backgrounds. But if you don't, then it can become a kind of a, 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 a trash, uh, you know, where you sort of throw all the scattering you don't want to know about. For instance, in the Corelli data, we have all these powder rings that are coming from um, the sample environment cryostats and, um, you know, just uh, aluminum rings or something like that. And, uh, and again, well, the rings don't exactly go into the R equals zero, but they... But they uh, You've, by doing this kind of Fourier filtering, you end up with just a discrete set of spots that, that is completely dominated by the disorder you're interested in, and all the other features have gone into some sort of background processes, which are... Uh, so it's a, it's a good way of cleaning up your signal, actually. <laughs> if, uh, um, if that entirely answers you. I mean, whether you should subtract a background or not is sort of an open question in some cases. We're in, we're only just learning how to use this technique, and I think there's so you know I think over the next few years will be an interesting time to find out you know what are the really the best ways of getting the most robust analyses based on these new ideas. But um, you know the Swiss have got us th this far, and now I think the whole community can help to refine the you know it's like the early days of Rietveld, you know, bef before all of the last 30 years of 40 years of of um, you know more sophisticated corrections. Thank <laughs> you.